P7. Uh, tufunye somo liyo lungeleza okuva eri master chibuka uh, vude ku savio atuwa kwenye ni SST okuva ewa master ya sosewo silas. Uh, kusawe no master utaya atuse ava uh, yukana matazi na mugongo ilaba nafe abali musini ya eyokuna ava tuwa li somo ya physics atena mwe uh, wali okubanga tuwa dedela paka uh, saweza. Humo wawana atuwe gati lako okutuwe somo edala ilaba nafe ava sini ya eyomu kaka. Kusawe no saba mkirize master utaya mwanilize atatu tuwale mu physics. Uh, good morning all our dear viewers, uh, specifically the candidates who are awaiting to sit their UCE exams. Uh, my names have been mentioned. I'm Lutaya Kenneth, physics teacher from Uganda Matters Namugongo. I'm humbled and indeed very glad to be here today to see to it that uh, even within the crisis that we are having, we can do something and uh, help you, especially the candidates. So today, I would like to talk about a very important and a critical topic in physics. I want to talk about heat. I'm aware that uh, Majority of us, if not all of us, uh, should be familiar with this term, uh, depending uh, for, on the various institutions that we are all going to, at least somewhere in Form 1 or Form 2, the teacher should have introduced this topic. If not, for those of us who did not get that introduction in Form 1 and Form 2, we can base on the knowledge that we got from primary. So without wasting time, I want to first of all uh, review what majority of us could have done in Form 1 and Form 2, where we talk about heat as being a form of energy. Possessed by a body by virtue of its temperature. Uh, this we consider to be the scientific definition of it. But uh, what is the meaning? According to that statement, science is telling us that for as long as a body is at a certain temperature, then it possesses a certain form of energy, which we are calling heat. And uh, indeed, we can go on and uh, determine the quantity of this heat. We can also go on and discuss how this heat is being transferred from various bodies. We can also talk about measuring the temperature since heat involves temperature. And uh, this, I'm guessing, majority of us have done in Form 1 and Form 2. So just a brief reminder and a quick one. Under this topic, we look at basically three things. Number one is thermometry. Uh, number two, we look at heat transfer. And then number three, uh, we look at uh, measurement of heat. Uh, what we usually call calorimetry. Under thermometry, uh, all of us at least have uh, that brief knowledge where we look at uh, determining the temperature of a body using the various types of uh, temperatures. We go on and discuss the various types of temperatures, not so much to detail for our level, but at least uh, we talk about the clinical thermometer uh, to detail. So then under heat transfer, this is where we are looking at the various ways in which heat is being transferred. And uh, you may remember that we talked about a mode of conduction, which is common in metals. Uh, then we have a mode of convection, uh, which is common in fluids. That is uh, both the gases and the liquids. Uh, then we also talked about uh, the mode of uh, radiation, uh, which is common in uh, vacuums and involves the transfer of heat by means of an electromagnetic radiation. So today, 
I may not talk about this because I'm under the assumption that at least the majority of us have uh, gone through it from the various institutions uh, that we are attending. However, I would love to take this opportunity to bring you up to speed with what we would be covering uh, during uh, this last course of, uh, of our syllabus. By now, at least, I believe that most of the candidates in Form 4, irrespective of the school that you're going, you must be doing a study, or at least the teacher was planning to do a study under the subsection of calorimetry, measurement of heat. So today, I would like to pick it from here. And I want to discuss a few things with you. I may not do a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and aid your revision, those who are revising, and uh, I'm also going to try and uh, give a sense of direction to those who have already covered this and maybe uh, they're trying to throw out questions here and there. So in the section of measurement of heat, we must know the following. Uh, number one, because heat is a form of energy, it means that it is measured in joules. So SI unit is joules. Number two, in order for us to measure the amount of heat possessed by any body, we must know certain things about the body. For example, if I have a cup of water at a certain temperature, it may be hot, it may be cold. Before I go on and calculate or investigate the magnitude of heat possessed by this water at that particular temperature, I first of all need information on what is its mass, and not only that, but what is its heat capacity or specific heat capacity. So we are speaking of uh, heat capacity and then specific heat capacity. I want to strongly advise my fellow candidates who are watching me outside there that uh, if you have any reference book around you, you may pick it up and then uh, you try and work with me through this. I want to basically be making reference to Abbott, uh, our reference book, uh, Ordinary Level Physics by A.F. Abbott. And uh, if you try to go and read about this particular subsection in the Abbott, you discover that up, they, they, they indeed give us information on what we are calling heat capacity. And basically, what is heat capacity? Everybody requires a certain amount of heat in order for it to change its temperature. Of course, if I have hot water, then it means that initially it was at a certain temperature which was raised in order for it to get to this new temperature. Uh, at the same time, if I have cold water, then it means that at some point it was at room temperature and probably lost some of this heat and then went to the lower temperature. However, for every given mass of any substance, there is a certain amount of heat energy that we must supply in order for it to change its temperature by any value. That term is what I'm going to define as heat capacity. If you have where you're writing, you may write and say that the heat capacity of any substance is the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of any mass of this substance. So that is heat capacity in general. You have a certain mass, you want to raise it by uh, a, certain, uh, a certain number of degrees. Actually, 
heat capacity, we are raising the temperature of any mass of a substance by one Kelvin. Let us go on and study this uh, uh, slowly. I want to start with one Kelvin. Why? If I know the amount of energy required to change, uh, to, uh, to raise the temperature of this substance by one Kelvin, then if I wish to raise the temperature by more than one Kelvin, I'll just get, it will just be a multiplying factor of the other term, which I've already got in respect to one Kelvin. However, what do we call specific capacity? If now I go down and I reduce on this mass, and I deal with only one kilogram of this mass, then the amount of heat energy that I need in order to raise the temperature of this one kilogram mass by one Kelvin is what I will call the specific heat capacity. In most of our reference books, you're going to find this uh, represented by the symbol, small c, and then you may find this represented by the symbol, capital C. Capital C representing heat capacity, small c representing specific capacity, depending on the reference book that you're using. But uh, we must note that heat capacity is in reference to any mass being raised by one Kelvin. Specific capacity, we are talking of only one kilogram of that mass. So, these two values will help us, uh, they're going to help us determine the quantity of heat that is uh, dissipated by a body when it is dropping in temperature or that is uh, gained by a body when it is rising in temperature. At this moment, allow me, first of all, uh, talk about specific capacity in detail. When you read in most of our reference books, they are going to mention that the specific capacity of any substance is usually a constant value. For example, specific capacity of water will be represented by 4200 joules uh, per kilogram per Kelvin. How do we arrive at the units? They are from the definition that if I'm to raise the temperature of a one kilogram mass of water, then I must supply 4,200 joules of heat energy in order for me to raise the temperature of a one kilogram mass of water by one Kelvin. So that is how I'm arriving at the units of specific capacity. However, if we are to look at other substances, uh, let me take an example of ice. Ice specific capacity is just half this value. Uh, 2100 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. We are seeing that the specific capacity of water is different from the specific capacity of ice, implying that for a one kilogram mass of either of the two, that is to say water and ice, we require different amounts of heat energy in order to raise their temperature by one Kelvin. This we must note that we can use to our advantage, and at the same time, it may be a disadvantage. I've only listed these two, but uh, several other values have got the, their constants corresponding to the specific capacity, as you may see in the reference books. But I want to focus so much on water. Why? Water, among all the substances that uh, we usually deal with, has the highest specific capacity. And because of that, water is being used in certain areas due to this advantage. For example, what is the advantage of uh, the high specific capacity of water? We may all agree that if you have something hot and you wish to cool it, the first thing that is going to come to your mind, pour water on it. Why? Because when you pour water on it, uh, what, if it is a fire, it will go off. Uh, if it was a flame, it will do the same thing. If it was a hot body, we are going to see it cooling. But what exactly is water doing? Pouring water on it, water is drawing the heat energy that the other one is possessing, consuming it, 
but in the process it is cooling it. Of all liquids, why is water the best to, be, to act as a coolant? Because when we use it under those circumstances, then the water is behaving like a coolant. It is trying to cool uh, the other body. We are seeing that the specific capacity of water is 200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. This means that you need a lot of energy to just raise a one kilogram mass of water by just one Kelvin. In order to put this uh, in the best language, you can imagine a hot body uh, may be possessing heat energy of 80 joules. When I pour water on it, it is going to quickly cool, and yet the water will also not be so much affected because that 80 joules possessed by the other will quickly be absorbed by this water, and we shall still have the water not even changing in temperature that much. That's how it is able to cool it very fast and effectively. Commonest application of this idea is in the car radiators or uh, the cooling system of the car engine. All of us will agree that uh, at a certain point, if you've escorted mommy or daddy to do service at any petrol station, during the course of the service, oftentimes they may say that uh, the engine needs a coolant. And then whoever is at the service bay will go on and open the bonnet and pour some water somewhere. If you have never taken keen interest to know why are they pouring water there, now is the time. Because we know that the engine, when it is running, uh, several parts are in motion, friction is in play, therefore heat energy is being dispensed at a certain point. So the engine is heating up. Overheating of the engine will cause damages to some of the parts and indeed lead to damages on the entire car system. So, during the design of the car engine, we always put room for a radiator where we pour water, and then the water starts circulating inside there, moving through several parts of the car engine, cooling them down, ensuring that the engine plays its role effectively. But at the same time, allow me to talk about something very small. Uh, to those people who are keen and observant when the service is being done, there is a one liter bottle of what the serviceman may call a coolant that they also bring and add to the water. You may be wondering uh, what is the role of that if the role of the water is to do the cooling, then why do they add in the other unique bottle which is usually in red or green color and then they also say that it's a coolant, mix it with water. Uh, water, when it is playing that role, it can also cause damages to the engine because of uh, its chemical properties. Once it gets in contact with the, cap, uh, with the engine parts, which are usually made of metal, some bit of corrosion may occur, or what we can basically call rusting. So the purpose of the other small bottle, the one liter, maybe two liters, which they add on top of the water is to ensure that it prevents that process of rusting or it prevents the corrosion since water is, is not very good at preventing that. So the other compound or liquid which they add to the water is to prevent that from happening. I hope at, uh, by now someone out there is trying to follow me and uh, they are picking something from this. So I've talked about specific capacity definition, given uh, examples, and mentioned that this is a constant value. I've also talked about the advantages of it being high. Uh, maybe the other advantage we probably we have already seen, this, the high specific capacity of water is also responsible for the land and sea breeze, because we know that uh, uh, the high specific capacity heats up slowly, but also loses heat slowly. So this is also responsible for the land and sea breeze, which probably the teacher must have talked about when they are, uh, when they are doing convection, the mode of heat transfer of convection. Now, after knowing these things, 
about our body. Probably we know its specific capacity, we know its seat capacity. How do we go on and use this information to determine the amount or the magnitude of heat energy possessed by the body? Uh, physics, as you're all aware, is a very close relative of mathematics. We, we are going to use a certain mathematical equation in order for us to determine the magnitude of the heat energy possessed by any body. And that equation is given as this. Remember, specific heat capacity small c was in reference to the heat energy required to raise the temperature of a one kilogram mass of a substance by one Kelvin. Now, here I am having a mass which is not one kilogram, wishing to raise its temperature beyond one Kelvin. This equation is going to help me and do the job. Why? If I have a certain mass and I know the heat energy corresponding to one kilogram, the heat energy corresponding to this mass in order to raise its temperature by one Kelvin will be the product of these two, according to mathematics. C is to one kilogram. So if I have m kilograms, then the heat energy will be m times C. At the same time, because I wish to even raise its temperature beyond one Kelvin, I am also putting in this term, which I'm calling the temperature rise. Uh, let me go on and define this. This is the mass of the substance. Uh, C, we are calling the specific heat capacity of the substance. Uh, uh, this term, delta theta, uh, we are calling it uh, the temperature rise. Uh, let me generalize it, temperature change. <coughs> you can imagine if, if my body is initial at a temperature theta 1, and I wish to raise this temperature to a value theta 2, then the temperature change will be theta 2 minus theta 1. I hope that everyone is familiar with the terms that I'm using. Uh, theta being a representation of temperature, delta theta, I've talked about it as a temperature change. I want to use a numerical example to demonstrate this. Uh, for example, we can present you with a, a question of this nature that uh, you forgive me, I, will, I may not write it on the blackboard. Uh, but let me go on and read it for you, dear candidates out there. Probably you can write it down. How much heat is needed? How much heat is needed to raise the temperature of five kilograms of iron? How much heat is needed to raise the temperature? of five kilograms of iron from 30 degrees centigrade to 40 degrees centigrade, full stop. So, because we've said that in order to determine the quantity of heat possessed by anybody, we must know the specific capacity. Uh, during the exam, we shall simplify this for you. Uh, we shall always give you the value, the constant value of the specific capacity for various substances, if being asked to determine the amount of heat that they possess. So, in this case, I want us to put an addition to our question that uh, take the specific capacity of iron to be 440 joules 
take the specific capacity of iron to be 440 joules uh, per kilogram per Kelvin. So, uh, to me here in the studio, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to summarize my question in this nature. I have a certain mass of iron. And the question mentions that it is 5 kilograms. Its initial temperature The question mentions that it is 30 degrees centigrade. I wish to raise it from that to a certain final temperature of 40 degrees C. And they have told me that the specific heat capacity of the iron is 440 joules per kilogram, per Kelvin. <coughs> so, we've said that if we want to know the amount of heat energy that will be involved in this process of the iron changing temperature from 30 degrees C to 40 degrees C, we shall use this equation here that Heat, heat energy needed is the value, uh, comma H, or some books may use the value Q, capital Q, uh, to represent uh, the heat energy. I'm using H in my case. I hope you you follow along with this. Uh, this value H is MC, change in temperature. It is the mass of the iron, specific capacity of the iron, and the temperature change that we wish to cause uh, to this piece of iron. Because the information is already given, I'm going to go on and substitute this. My mass is five kilograms. My specific capacity is 440 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. And then my change in temperature is the difference between 40 and 30 degrees C. At this point, allow me clear the curiosity of a candidate who's out there thinking or debating a scenario that why are we using why are we calculating the temperature difference without converting these temperatures to Kelvin? And yet, I am using a specific capacity, which is in reference to a temperature change of 1 Kelvin. I, I hope I'm being clear enough on this. I have specific capacity in reference to a temperature change of 1 Kelvin. But in my equation, I am finding the temperature difference, leaving it in degrees, uh, leaving it in degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, this is because, as we may have seen in a thermometry at the introduction of uh, this topic in Form 1 and Form 2, or somewhere uh, along one of the primary levels, we said that the temperature on the Celsius scale has a relationship with that on the Kelvin scale, which is that the temperature capital T on the Kelvin scale is the temperature uh, theta on the Celsius scale plus the term 273. And if I'm to add 273 on each of these values, in order for me to convert them to Kelvin, then it means that finding the difference will still lead me back to this. Because what I'm adding on 40, I'm again adding on 30. But in the end, I'm going to subtract it. So that's why during these calculations, 
we usually don't waste a lot of time in converting these temperatures to Kelvin. Since the temperature difference, irrespective of the units, will remain the same. Whether the temperature is being used in Kelvin or the temperature value is being used in uh, uh, degrees Celsius, the temperature difference will still be the same value. Uh, for those of you out there watching me from home, uh, you can try it. You can add 273 on 40, add 273 on 30, then subtract. Later on, subtract 40 from 30. You still have the same difference of 10 degrees C. So, back to this. In order to conclude it, I am going to have the figure uh, of this, which I can uh, quickly put here in my calculator. I hope all candidates out there are having a calculator. Now is the time to use it. Uh, I am getting a value of uh, 2200 joules of energy. So this is what we're saying, that if I have a mass of iron, 5 kilograms in weight, at an initial temperature of 30, and I wish to raise this temperature to 40 degrees C, I need to supply 22,000 joules of heat energy to it in order for me to arrive at that temperature from 30 degrees C. This is one of the commonest questions that many of you candidates are going to encounter in both paper one and paper two, and indeed in both the objective and the structured form of question. It usually just requires us to use uh, this formula in order to calculate the heat. However, I'm going to do another unique example, uh, which will also help us understand uh, the concept of uh, calculating heat. My second example is going to be on a question where I'm going to present to you a mass which is in a different unit from that of the specific capacity. Uh, take an example. Uh, you may write this down. I may ask you to find the amount of heat energy, find the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of 20 grams of water, required to raise the temperature of 20 grams of water from 30 degrees C to 60 degrees C. find the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of 20 grams of water from 30 degrees C to 60 degrees C. Full stop. Uh, we are going to take the specific capacity of water to be 4,200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Uh, dear candidates, do not be worried about cramming uh, these constants corresponding to the specific capacity of uh, various substances. When uh, required to be used, we shall always give you this value uh, in the question. So, again, I want to summarize this question, like how I did for this. I have a certain mass of water. And the question is saying it's two grams. Uh, it is at an initial temperature of 30 degrees C. I wish to raise it to a final temperature of 60 degrees C. And they have mentioned that the specific heat capacity, which I'm abbreviating as SHC, of the water 
is four two hundred joules per kilogram per Kelvin. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the heat energy again uh, required will be the mass of the water, specific capacity of the water times the temperature change. However, in order for us to arrive at the units of heat energy being joules, when the specific capacity is in joules per kilogram per Kelvin, then it means that the mass must be in kilograms. And in this question, I've given you a mass in grams, implying that we have a task of converting the mass of the water given from grams to kilograms before we use this equation in order to determine the amount of heat energy required for this process in joules. So what I usually do, because all of us have attended the Form 1 lesson of uh, measurement, I am going to go on and uh, do the conversion here. When I'm converting from grams to kilograms, I divide by 1,000. Then I'm going to multiply with the 4,200 specific capacity, and then also multiply with the temperature change of 60 uh, to 30. So this is going to go down to uh, 0 0.2 times 42 uh, times 30, depending on the mathematics that you have done. But of course, we all have calculators out there. We can quickly just substitute that. And uh, it will lead us to a value of 252 joules of heat energy. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, my dear candidates, for following this far. And uh, I hope that people are learning something out there, uh, despite of the crisis. Otherwise, this has been my second example where I have given you a mass which is, in, which is not in uh, kilograms, and yet the specific capacity is corresponding to a one kilogram mass of the water. So allow me to take a short break, and then we shall be back with you. Thank you very much. Benzege, uh, Master Lutaya, Kenneth Okuva, Enamugongo, Uganda Matazi.